Good afternoon. Uh, welcome uh, to this political economy project event. Uh, my name is Doug Irwin. I'm a professor in the economics department and the co-director of the political economy project. Uh, thank you very much for uh, coming this afternoon. If uh, John Maynard Keynes was the most influential economist in the first half of the 20th century, arguably Milton Friedman was the most influential economist in the second half of the 20th century. He won the Nobel Prize in economics in 1976 for his work on monetary economics and consumption theory. But he's best known to the public for his uh, policy advocacy in favor of free markets and limited government through such books as Capitalism and Freedom and Free to Choose. Indeed, the range of public policy issues that he analyzed and put before the public is quite amazing. He did so with great originality and with incredible impact uh, even today. So if you're interested in issues such as rent control or universal basic income, near earned income tax credit, or the centrality of central banks and monetary policy, or the military draft versus a volunteer army, or school choice and vouchers, or floating exchange rates versus fixed exchange rates, and I could go on. Friedman had his hand in all of these uh, ideas. He was very controversial at his time, uh, and not everyone appreciates today his impact and his influence and his legacy. So for example, in the 2020 campaign, Joe Biden said, Milton Friedman's not in charge anymore. Now why was he referring to an economist who had been dead for at least 15 years by that point, just speaks, I think, to the power of his ideas and the influence he has even today. Well, we are absolutely delighted and honored to welcome to our campus Jennifer Burns from Stanford University, who has just published a new book, in fact, today's publication day, a new book biography, an intellectual biography of Milton Friedman. And she will explain in much greater detail his contributions and his legacy. We have one copy left for Dartmouth students. Um, it is free. Everyone else, if you wish to purchase a copy, uh, you can do so outside, and she's happy to um, uh, sign copies uh, at the after our event. Uh, she's a professor of history at Stanford University, a research fellow at Stanford's Hoover Institution, and the author of a previous book, uh, Goddess of the Market, Ayn Rand and the American Right. Uh, this is her uh, major second book, as I mentioned, just published today, already been reviewed in the New Republic and the Atlantic, and many more to come. So please join me in welcoming Jennifer Burns. Thanks, Doug, for that nice introduction. Thanks, all of you, for coming out this afternoon. I know it's exam time, so hopefully I can give you a break from studying and a little bit of mental calisthenics of a different time. Um, so as Doug mentioned, today is publication day. This is the first time I have seen the book out in the wild, and just looking around the room and seeing it is really incredible. I started the day with a trip to Capitaph which is a couple miles down the road. It's Milton and Rose Friedman's summer home where they spent um, many months of the year, in fact, up to half a year here. And actually, a lot of the research that Friedman did, um, he based out of the Dartmouth College Library, which is why he had the home here, so he could get access to the library. Um, so anyhow, I think it's sort of fitting that you are one of the first audiences, actually the first audience I'm talking to when the book actually exists and is available. So thank you for that. Um, so Doug mentioned I am a historian at Stanford and a research fellow at the Hoover Institution. And over time, I have developed um, somewhat inadvertently a specialty in neglected figures on the political right. So my first book was a biography of the novelist and philosopher Ayn Rand. And now I have this book on Milton Friedman. And you may not think that Friedman is a neglected figure. Um, but this will be, or this is, the first full-length archival biography of Friedman that takes him from his days as a Boy Scout in Rahway, New Jersey, to the cover of Time magazine. And so today I want to talk about my research and some things I found that helped me understand Friedman and his milieu and give you a little preview of the book. Um, so first of all, who is Milton Friedman? I mean, Doug covered a little bit of this. You may know him as a Nobel Prize winning economist who's famous for his attack on the Phillips curve, for his theory of permanent income, as the founder of the school of monetarism, which we could summarize with the dictum, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomena. Or you might know him as the great champion of free markets, the author of books like capitalism and freedom, this sort of YouTube Friedman who became an icon of the case for capitalism and, and um, uh, unrestricted markets, and the star of the TV series, Free to Choose. You may also know him as a policy innovator. 
And Doug touched on some of this, but it's worth repeating. The list of proposals have started as a kind of wild idea in Friedman's mind and also seemed completely wild and crazy when he tried to uh, convince others that now are really just common sense to us. So the idea that income taxes are withheld from your paycheck directly by the IRS, as Friedman's fingerprints on it, and armed forces that relies on paid volunteers instead of a draft, state supplied educational vouchers to cover the cost of tuition, the earned income tax credit or tax rebates more generally, also known as universal basic income, a world where international currencies float one against the other. So all of these and more are the achievements of Milton Friedman. Some of you probably have others in mind, but I'm guessing even the experts among you may not have known until today that Friedman was once a Boy Scout. So this is kind of the biographer's task. How do I bring to life this monumental intellect? Um, show how he was shaped by his times and he in turn shaped them. And so I'm just gonna highlight a few episodes I cover in the book and use these to underscore his importance for our world today. Specifically, I wanna talk about three things. I wanna talk about Friedman as a classical liberal, how uh, uh, and what that meant and how he went on to develop a new method of policy design that he believed was compatible with classical liberal principles. Then I want to talk about him as the founder of monetarism and a little detail on this new school of economic thought that he founded with Anna Schwartz. And then I want to focus on his role as a lifelong critic and analyst of the Federal Reserve, um, which is more relevant than ever today. OK, so let me start with Friedman as a classical liberal on his basic family background. So Friedman um, grew up in Rahway, New Jersey. It's a small suburban town. And it's important to note this was an unusual background for an American Jewish family, for the son of Jewish immigrants. Um, his parents were part of the great wave of immigration into the United States in the early decades of the 20th century. Most uh, Jewish immigrants from Europe went to Chicago or New York and had a very urban uh, experience. Friedman's family continued on to Rahway, New Jersey. So he had this sort of prototypical American boyhood, scooping ice cream in his family's store, uh, rising to the top of his class in the public school system. The real black mark in his life was that when he was a senior in high school, his father died very suddenly. So he went uh, uh, from, from his uh, schools in Rahway, he went to Rutgers in New Jersey, where he was, again, accumulated a brilliant record and went on to the University of Chicago. Now, it's really critical that he arrived at the University of Chicago in 1932. This is like pretty much the nadir of the Great Depression, 25% unemployment, bread lines are starting to spread, the sense of crisis is becoming very palpable and real. And in fact, it's this economic crisis that propelled him to economics rather than he was considering math uh, uh, or um, a, a less sort of practical and applied discipline. And he decided economics was really the question of the age. But it was also a moment of political crisis. Social democracy, fascism, communism, all these different alternatives were on the rise. And there was this broad critique um, uh, uh, of the way poli politics had been done and societies had been organized. And Friedman was immediately immersed in these questions. You couldn't avoid them in the Great Depression. There were um, you know, strikes, labor agitation, communists all throughout campus, and this palpable sense that capitalism had failed, that his generation was living through the failure of capitalism. And of course, there was a Marxist tradition predicting that exactly this would happen. So Friedman arrives at Chicago. He's immersed in this moment of crisis. And he's influenced, sorry, I, need to, I got a little out of order, um, very deeply by two men who considered themselves classical liberals, Frank Knight and Henry Simons. Now, Frank Knight and Henry Simons both valued individual freedom and limited government. They considered themselves classical liberals. But at the same time, they understood that liberalism was on the defensive and was imperiled and needed to be rethought and reformulated to match these challenges from both the right and the left. So basically, they knew voters were no longer buying what they were selling. They wanted to figure out how it could be reformulated. The other thing is that both of them believed quite strongly that the federal government had to play a role in the economic crisis. 
And this is something I didn't really fully appreciate until I began my research. Chicago economists in the 1930s were not by any stretch laissez-faire economists. They didn't say this is a natural correction, this is a natural downturn in the business cycle. No, they all recognized something was profoundly awry. And so they sort of flooded the Roosevelt administration actually with a whole range of different proposals, many of which were ultimately adopted in the Banking Act of 1935. So Friedman comes to a place that both has a free market orientation and rejects sort of traditional uh, laissez-faire and is wrestling with this basic question. How would you safeguard free markets and at the same time create more broadly shared prosperity? How could you create a safety net that wouldn't choke off dynamic uh, 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 market forces? And these are really perennial questions. These are ongoing questions. We ask these questions today. Uh, we may never ultimately solve them. We may always balance, have to balance these things. But in the 1930s, these questions are so urgent because you're facing widespread political crisis in Europe and Asia, and it looks like the United States could blow up next. So I know these are important to Friedman, even though he's kind of a nobody at the time. He's in graduate school. Okay, He does well for a graduate student. But I know what he's thinking. I know what he's reading because I spent 10 years in his archives. It's like 200 boxes of papers. So I know what he checked out. So I have a syllabus of books he checked out. And I can see he writes a check mark when he's reading them. And some of them, he writes the prices next to them. So I, I know he's interested in these questions. Um, and then I can read very deeply in the work of Knight and Simons and know what they're talking about. So I had all that background. But still, I was pretty surprised when I came across this proposal in his papers. It's dated in 1939. And I figured out this is actually the very first policy paper Milton Friedman ever wrote. It comes at an unusual moment in his career. So he started at Chicago. After about two years in Chicago, he moved to Columbia, where he would ultimately get his degree. And after some time at Columbia, he went and he worked for the federal government in a New Deal agency. Now, this was a very common move. It was the federal government was pretty much the only place that was hiring economists in the mid-1930s. Um, and so uh, Friedman went to DC. Sorry, I have to hop ahead to this slide. Um, here's a picture of he and his wife, Rose, who was also an economic student at the University of Chicago. And I don't know if any of you have done this, but if you go to DC in cherry blossom season, you go in front of the cherry blossoms. I guess today you take a selfie. Back in the day, you posed with your partner or significant other. Anyhow, so Milton and Rose did this too. We can date this tradition all the way back to 1935. So he's in Washington, DC, and he's working as an associate economist at the National Research Council. This is part of the Department of Labor. And he was on this project that was called the Study of Consumer Purchases. Now, this is really the first era of big data. The federal government is trying to figure out what is going on in the economy. How much are people buying? How much income do they have? So they survey 1 million families. And I've seen these surveys in the archives. It's very long. They kind of unfurl. Like, how many yams did you buy? What was your budget on clothing? How much did you spend on funerals? Um, did you have a border in the house? Did that border have meals or just a bed? Just incredibly granular data. And Friedman's job was to figure out how now that we've got 1 million punch cards, basically, because they're very rudimentary technology, how do we analyze them? Because he's interested in statistics, he's kind of one of the whiz kids thinking this through. So, so Friedman really is um, hes in a low-level position. He's not crafting policy. He's not setting the direction of the efforts of the, the federal state. But he is nonetheless in a key role of kind of designing the study and parsing the data. OK, so let's go back to this 1939 paper. It's a couple years later. Friedman is living in New York City now. And he's moved from his position in the federal government. He's now working for the National Bureau of Economic Research, NBER, uh, uh, still exists today, very prominent economics research organization. And while he's working for NBER, he meets Gunnar Myrtle. You may know the name Gunnar Myrtle. He's later famous for a book he writes about American race relations called An American Dilemma. 
He's a Swedish socialist. He's very different politically from Friedman. And so the two of them meet. I don't know exactly how. Probably economists at Columbia hung out together in the weekends, and they sort of ended up together in some weekend uh, uh, moment. But I know that there was a real meeting of the minds, because what happened afterwards that I see in the archive is that Friedman wrote up the ideas he and Myrtle had discussed in this paper. It was never published, and I'll, the title, which may be hard to see because it's so archaic, is, quote, an objective method of determining a minimum standard of living. And so it gives us a window into kind of how Friedman was thinking and what is he taking away from this moment of living through the Great Depression. And so how does Friedman approach this problem, the prob problem of poverty or inequality? Well, he begins with this very highly educated and clear and sort of elusive style, the poor are always with us, kind of a biblical citation, right? But then he goes very quickly to be empirical. And he says, previous criteria have been, quote, vague, qualitative, and subjective. Then he says, though, we could have new criteria, and these could be based on, quote, the development of the science of nutrition. So the other thing happening in the 1930s is they've discovered the calorie. There's like great advances, and it's like now we have a unit called a calorie that we can relate to the nutritional needs of the human person. And so Friedman basically decides a minimum standard of living can be based, designed on the food needed, the caloric intake needed that people need. That's objective. Furthermore, you can go look at income and consumption data, which he's just spent years analyzing, and then decide from that how, how much an adequate diet would cost, right? So you can kind of cross-reference these different things. And you could come up with what he calls a minimum standard of living. And his idea is that you would provide nutrition. Kind of food would be the base. You would provide enough money so everybody could get enough food, right? So they're not going to starve to death. So he writes to Myrtle. Myrtle writes back. Myrtle doesn't really, not sure about it, sort of. Maybe you need to consider other things. I'm not sure. And then it kind of just fizzles out. Nonetheless, this is like a remarkable moment. You have two thinkers from opposite sides of the ideological spectrum with very different commitments coming together to wrestle with a common problem, and even better, kind of getting close to agreement on this, coming up, coming up with something very uh, it's, it's, you know, related. Now, the devil is in the details, of course, and he couldn't work out those details. But it points us to what is powerful about this idea. It palpably attempts to reconcile individual choice and liberty with a social safety net. And Friedman's view is that the minimum income would alleviate poverty or address it in a profound way, yet it would also be compatible with the price system. In fact, you would be putting people who would otherwise not be participating in economic activity, you would be empowering them to more fully participate in that price system. And it would also be compatible with individual choice and liberty, because you wouldn't need to set up big mandates. You wouldn't need to set up a government bureaucracy, uh, unlike programs that are being developed at the time, the New Deal agencies. So what happened to Friedman's proposal? In the short run, nothing. He writes this up. It's 1939. He goes on to other things. It resurfaces, though, in the 1960s, and it's now called a negative income tax. And this is one of the major proposals of capitalism and freedom. And the idea is that if your income falls beneath a certain threshold, instead of paying income tax to the government, the government will pay you an income. And so there's then a complex political story. The negative income tax is actually taken up by Richard Nixon. It becomes the centerpiece of something called the Family Assistance Plan, which was an effort to guarantee a minimum income to American families eventually gets shut down, doesn't work politically, and finally reemerges as the earned income tax credit. Um, so you can see it gets attached. The word earned has now been attached to it, which I should say was something Friedman really distinguished. He felt like there shouldn't be a litmus test for this benefit. It should be universal and automatic. So kind of weaves its way through the system. A lot of sausage is ground up and made. It comes out as the EITC. Uh, this is a policy that Ronald Reagan called the, quote, best anti-poverty, best pro-family, best job creation measure to come out of Congress. And the studies on the EITC generally report that it really makes a difference, that it, it delivers a lot 
uh, for its costs. So what's important here, a couple things. One is that the EITC also becomes and remains today a kind of basic architecture of much policy. Right? If you think about the coronavirus relief plans, when a lot of money had to go out quickly to people who needed it, it very much resembled that. You think about the child tax credit. Um, over time, using the tax system, using rebates as kind of levers of policy and changing incentives and economic realities has become kind of de rigueur, or at least a, a tool in the policy toolkit. And it really starts with Milton Friedman. And so, Secondly, this episode tells us that Friedman was in the middle of that great rethinking I mentioned. He was wrestling with the same questions as his professors, even if he wasn't well known. And it gives us a window into how young Friedman would tackle this problem. And then, as I show in the book, it becomes he, he kind of does this again and again in different domains. And so those broad range of policies he crafts are organized in some way around this idea of using the price system itself as a mechanism of policy. Now, there's uh, uh, these two other themes, then, I want to develop around this idea. One is that his ideas end up reverberating. They start um, in a smaller world. They end up reverberating beyond those who share his political values into the broader world. So the EITC becomes a policy that has broad um, support across the political divide. And secondly, as I said, Friedman's policies are kind of unified by this single insight. This is the basic cast of mind that I see with Friedman again and again, prices as the mechanism of policy. And this may sound intuitive to us or not that unusual, but in the New Deal and afterward, a lot of policy was around shaping and controlling prices and setting them at a certain level. Friedman's approach is totally different, is to rather take the mechanism of prices and their responsiveness and the way they incentivize people and put that at the core of policy. Um, so instead of building an institution, a program, a plan, or a regulation, uh, you kind of devolve the responsibility downward using the price system to harness individual choice and incentives. And it's a familiar move to us today, so much so that it doesn't, it's hard to remember a time when it wasn't there, but I really trace it back uh, to Friedman and all the way to this earlier paper. Okay, so let me talk now about, oh, here's the last EITC slide. Uh, <laughs> Joe Money, come and get it. Um, let me talk now a little bit about Friedman as a monetarist. And I began with one set of questions that Friedman addressed, which was how do I, uh, what should be done about the crisis and the social problems caused by the Great Depression? But there's a second set of questions is like, well, why did this happen in the first place? What is the cause of the Great Depression? And when Friedman got to Chicago, he learned one interpretation of the crisis, which held it was largely a monetary crisis. It was centered in a banking and financial system. And Definitely, this was widely shared insofar as the banking system was the first thing that Roosevelt attempted to stabilize. Yet, within the broader field of economics, there was another set of interpretations, was that this revealed, if not a failure of capitalism, a, a sort of structural flaw in capitalism that needed to be managed and addressed. And this was the idea that the federal government needed to support aggregate demand in the economy. And the way it would do this was what became called the fiscal revolution, a large federal budget designed specifically to stimulate the economy and to keep it growing. Now, Friedman never embraced this approach. Now, sometimes you'll read that Friedman had a change of heart. After all, he worked for the New Deal, and then he changed his mind. But from all the research I've done, I feel very strongly that Friedman was never really a Keynesian, which became the label for demand management and the fiscal revolution. So my research shows he was skeptical of this Keynesian interpretation from the start. And the reason I know this is because I have his class notes from 1940 and 1941. Again, these are preserved in the archives, so I know what he's saying to his students when he's teaching them economics, and he's very suspicious um, he's suspicious of the later New Deal. He's suspicious of some of the fundamental arguments that demand is necessary. Um, 
I even find in the archive in the 1940s, he's using the phrase, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. So this is the 1940s. So he already has, um, I would say, a skepticism of Keynesianism, and he's already moving towards what will be the founding idea of monetarism. But he's skeptical. It doesn't mean he has the evidence. It doesn't mean he's ready to make the argument. And in fact, he'll make testing the hunch one of the major goals of his career. And to do this, he has a remarkable partner um, who is Anna Jacobson Schwartz. Now, Schwartz was a brilliant woman who was sidelined by the pervasive sexism in economics and her time. And Friedman would be one of the few who recognized her capacity. And I've thought a lot about why this is so. I think some of it is maybe down to personality. I also do think it's significant that the University of Chicago had a tradition of having a female economist, one, on its faculty. And so interestingly enough, Friedman would have been one of the few um, economists of his generation who had actually seen a woman as a professor of economics. And I have to believe that had some impact on his ability to take women seriously as intellectual contributors and colleagues. So nonetheless, he's, he joins Schwartz on this NBER project. And Schwartz is really the expert in the beginning. She's written two volumes on British monetary history. Um, she gives him a syllabus. Here's what you should read to get up to speed. He comes probably here to Dartmouth, checks out those books, and spends the summer reading in monetary history. Um, and what they are guided by is one of these ideas that Friedman has imbibed from Chicago. And this is the quantity theory of money. The idea that the physical quantity of money in the economy is relevant to the broad performance, uh, basically, of everything. So what Schwartz and Friedman start doing, actually just Schwartz, because she really does the research, is starting to measure this. OK, so I know you're sitting far away. So I'll just tell you what it says up here. Vault cash on the top. And then these are member banks, um, quarterly member banks. All, top, the top column is all different types of banks and financial institutions. And then these are columns of numbers for each date, June 30th, October 20th, December 30th. There are stacks and stacks of these in the archives. Schwartz is literally adding up figures. And she's actually having to go to some of these banks and say, can you give me your books? And then she brings them into her own books. So the type of you know, work that you would just Click, click, click. You just hop into a database and get all this information. She's literally building from the ground up. So they, and the other thing that's important to say is that this is deeply empirical work, is also deeply out of fashion at the time that they're doing this. This is a moment when uh, the advent of statistics and economics is becoming more popular, when modeling is becoming more popular, moving towards general equilibrium models. Very few people are doing this really fine-grained empirical research, but Friedman has been doing this for decades in the government. Schwartz is very uh, uh, able to do it. She's a real facility with finding historical data. So here they are doing the stuff that's literally being laughed at by other economists because it seems completely out of, like, why would you do this? It's just not where the interesting uh, uh, action is happening in the discipline. Now, the laughter stops in 1963 when they finally come out with their book that took more than a decade. So whenever I felt bad about like, when am I going to be done with my book? I'm like, OK, well, sometimes books take a long time, and that's OK. So they write a monetary history of the United States. This is really a remarkable book, and I encourage you to look at it. Um, it's a history of the United States with money as a central protagonist. And it's really fascinating to kind of follow this. And you see these episodes that you learn about in history class through a totally different lens, because now the actor is like the currency. Very, very interesting. But it really culminates in the chapter they write about the Great Depression. And they propose a new way of understanding the Great Depression. All of those columns of figures end up in these charts, which show and document a 30% decline in the quantity of money across the years of the Great Depression. And so they call the Great Depression the Great Contraction, when the money supply severely contracts. And so this is an interpretation of the Great Depression as first and foremost a monetary phenomenon. But it is the case that Friedman and Schwartz 
also clearly understood it as an institutional and political phenomenon because they go on to argue that the Federal Reserve could have prevented this deflation. Right? This is a deflation, a fall in prices, a contraction in economic activity. The Federal Reserve, after all, was supposed to be the lender of last resort. Uh, it was supposed to flush money through the system. It should have helped all those failing banks. It should have acted quickly to stabilize the system. And if it had kept money in the system, it would have prevented the severity of the downturn. And so out of this set of ideas of the Depression as a monetary phenomenon and the role of the Federal Reserve really grows the school of monetarism that focuses on monetary aggregates and quantities of money and how money behaves in the economic system. And again, this was a traditional part of economics that had sort of fallen by the wayside. I describe in some detail why the Federal Reserve had become um, less important to policymakers. But most economists were looking at the federal budget. The federal budget was where the action was. So it was really counterintuitive for Friedman to shift to money, even though to us it's like, well, of course money should have something to do with economics. That makes sense. It was nonetheless um, uh, uh, a startling argument for many of his contemporaries. But it's important that it's not just monetarists that take on this interpretation. This becomes broadly influential, and it really forms the basic playbook of economic policy ever since. The lesson that most people take is, OK, if the Federal Reserve did nothing and we got the Great Depression, the next time around, the Federal Reserve has to be ready and it has to do something. And so we can actually credit Friedman and Schwartz with having, helping the United States and indeed the globe to avoid another turndown of this uh, uh, depth and severity because they have this widely known solution now and they point to the institution that's really at the center, the Federal Reserve. So probably the first time this, you see this play out is in 1987. There's a very severe stock market crash resembling Black Monday in 1929. And Alan Greenspan, who's a personal friend of Friedman's, steps right up and says, the Fed is ready to do what it takes to restore confidence in the system, just kind of unambiguously taking accountability and taking responsibility. Or then there's Ben Bernanke talking to Friedman and Schwartz. Uh, and I think it was like a 90th birthday party for Friedman. He said, quote, regarding the Great Depression, you're right, we did it. We're very sorry. <laughs> but, <laughs> but thanks to you, we won't do it again. So, so I think that you know, historical research helps us see how this breakthrough was made. Um, both in terms of the actual putting together of the analysis and the interpretation. And biography also gives us some insight into why Friedman was such a great economist. And I argue in the book it's in large part because he took people like Anna Schwartz seriously. Um, he simply didn't have a large blind spot that many of his colleagues and peers did. And Schwartz is really the most obvious example of this. I don't have time to go into it in this talk, but in my book, I talk about all the other women uh, uh, who are relevant and important to his career, um, from his wife Rose to Margaret Reed, who went on to a long career at Chicago, um, to Dorothy Brady, who was Rose's best friend. And incidentally, a lot of these, uh, uh, the work that Friedman did with these women came out of their retreats in the summer to the areas around here where they were supposedly relaxing, but actually they were talking economics morning, noon, and night. And some really interesting ideas came out of that. OK, so I want to turn um, now to talking about Friedman and uh, the great inflation and his role as uh, a critic of the Federal Reserve. So a monetary history gave Friedman just a really incredible vantage point. Um, on economics. And one of the basic things it did, which studying history does, is, is help you know that things are not always going to stay the same. And of course, we sort of know this abstractly, but it's another thing to really know this, right? If you think about the recent banking crisis we went through, there was sort of an assumption that interest rates were just going to stay the same, right? Well, dwelling in a long period of time will tell you that things aren't going to always stay the same, and maybe you should have a contingency plan for when they change. OK, so with Friedman, it led him to question some basic economic relationships that others did not. 
And one was the relationship between inflation and unemployment. Now, in the 1950s and the 1960s, no one really worried about inflation. It was even seen as maybe a good thing because it was believed that inflation created low unemployment. So in other words, as rising prices were a sign the economy was sort of heating up or there was a lot of activity and jobs, uh, a lot of people would have jobs. So okay, we have prices going up, but a lot of people have jobs. That's okay. That's a trade-off we can live with. And uh, this was widely believed because it was widely seen in the data. And I'm kind of kind of direct you to the left side of the graph. Uh, inflation is red, unemployment is blue. And so you hear inflation going up and unemployment going down, inflation going down, and unemployment going up. So OK, you know, maybe, uh, maybe this is a trade-off we want to do. And this, was, this trade-off is often called the Phillips curve. So in 1967, Friedman gave a celebrated speech when he said, OK, this might work in the short run, but it's not going to work in the long run. In the long run, you could have both high inflation and high unemployment. And lo and behold, this uh, phenomenon, which was dubbed stagflation, in other words, stagnation and inflation combined, began to emerge across the 1970s. So Friedman looked like a prophet and a seer because he had discussed this wouldn't really happen. So we can look at our graph here, and we can see that they start to move together in the early 1970s. You start to get high inflation and high unemployment. And you see, again, the real spike leading into the 1980s. So this was stagflation that really hadn't, economists thought it was not theoretically possible. And so Friedman's triumph was in showing how it was theoretically possible, predicting it would happen, and then seeing it actually happen. So as a result, the 1970s were like the sort of peak Friedman. He was um, enormously influential. Uh, sorry, here's my graph of inflation coming up. And you see it again. I pick up in the uh, 1960s. And inflation is below 5% for almost all of the post-war era, even lower, and then starts to rise in the 70s, spiking again in the 1980s. OK, so, so this makes Friedman just enormously popular. Here he is as an advisor to Nixon. Uh, he's with George Shultz, his close friend in the Oval Office now. Nixon really liked to have Friedman's good graces and his support. He didn't really actually like to listen to Friedman, but he liked it to be seen as if he were listening to Friedman um, because of Friedman's stature. Here's another image. Um, this is a little bit creepy, but uh, <laughs> I don't know exactly what's going on here. But it's trying to gesture to um, Friedman's all-encompassing worldview and, and its dominance and importance, right? Friedman as the globe. Um, and so on the one hand, this is a time of professional triumph and vindication for Friedman. But I got another perspective on this from the archive, because amid this moment of triumph, there's a real moment of sadness, because it leads to the fracturing of his relationship with Arthur Burns, who is one of his oldest uh, friends. Here's a picture of Burns being grilled by Congress. Um, so Friedman had met Burns at Rutgers University. Um, and he called Burns his father figure, because he, remember, had lost his own father uh, shortly before going to college. And Friedman just venerated Burns like no other. And in fact, the letters between them are a really important source for my book, because they went across decades. They were very long. They were very detailed. And so I got all this insight into what Friedman was thinking and doing, because he would be writing to Burns about it. So Nixon appoints Burns to chair the Federal Reserve in January 1970. And it, it's interpreted at first as a victory for Friedman. You know, this is going to be the money matters Fed. It's going to be the Friedmanite Fed. It's not what happened. At first, things seemed to be going well. And remember, we're before the era of high inflation, although Friedman's worried it's coming. Um, Friedman is complimenting Burns. Um, you know, he's doing great at the Fed. He's taking, making it more professional, uh, uh, really kind of clearing house. And then comes a bombshell. Friedman opens a newspaper one day and finds out that Arthur Burns has said he supports incomes policy. What is incomes policy? It's a general catch-all phrase for wage and price guidelines. This is an effort to hem in inflation by saying, 
Don't raise your wages and don't raise your prices. And this is an idea that's associated with the Democratic Party, not the Republican Party, of which Burns is, is a, a, an appointee. And it also reveals that you have a very different understanding of inflation if you think inflation can be tamed by setting guidelines on wages and prices. Um, that's just a very different understanding than Friedman's, which inflation is a product of too much money in the system, and it's trying to regulate prices or wages with kind of a Band-Aid solution, not really a cure. So, so Friedman finds this in the newspaper uh, and is really upset. I'm going to read an excerpt now from the book where I kind of talk about the meaning of this. Far more than a policy disagreement, for Friedman, this speech was a profound rupture in his emotional universe. Later that evening, after hours of tossing and turning, Friedman arose from his bed and poured out his anguish. The incomes policy speech had left him sleepless, quote, saddened, dismayed, and depressed, he wrote to Burns in a passionate letter. Though I know this is not fair or right or generous, the word that keeps coming to mind is betrayed. How could Burns, who had repeated again and again his stance against wage and price controls, make such a reversal? The letter tacked between incredulity and loss. Never in my wildest dreams did I believe that the central bank virus was so potent it could corrupt even you in so short a time, Friedman mourned. Maybe there was a case to be made for incomes policy, but he simply could not imagine what it was. Quote, incomes policy in any shape and form is bad economics and the entering wedge for still worse economics, he wrote. It would obscure the real progress recently made in slowing inflation. Incomes policy would get the credit that belonged to monetary restraint. And, Friedman continued, the proposal, quote, verges in my mind on the dishonest in spreading lies to the public. It was simply not true, he continued, that inflation was, quote, produced by unions. Rather, it was produced, quote, only in Washington by misguided policy. Even Burns himself had said as much in the past. Although Friedman called only the policy dishonest, the implications extended to Burns's character. So, so it, it goes on from there, and I delve into the relationship more. This is, this is like this late night letter is just very intense, and there's a couple more very intense letters, and eventually Friedman kind of backs down and says, OK, I'll stop writing you angry letters. But he still continues to criticize Burns uh, uh, in public. And Friedman turns out to be right that Burns would go from incomes policy to advocating wage and price controls, which were, in fact, put in uh, during the Nixon administration. And Friedman became profoundly disappointed by Burns's erratic monetary policy. The other letters he would send would be things like, quote, what in God's name is happening? You know, and, and he would also, he and Anna Schwartz kept running their own numbers against the Fed. So, so Burns would be like, oh, things are fine. And he'd be like, no, they're not. Like, here's my data. Um, so it, it really was a tense relationship. Um, and in retrospect, Burns' monetary policy has been widely blamed for the great inflation because um, in large ways, Burns abdicated. Here's what he said to the cabinet amid this episode of high inflation, quote, Monetary policy, I feel, has done its job fully. And he used this then to argue for wage and price control. So, so this episode tells us some really important things about Friedman. I mean, one, it highlights how important ideas were to him and how he was willing to really risk his oldest and dearest friendship um, because of an agreement, a disagreement in, over ideas. Um, it also reminds us how out of the mainstream his ideas were and how in the mainstream they are now. That Burns could credibly claim monetary policy, I feel, has done its job fully. That incomes policy and wage and price controls were accepted uh, uh, is very different than, than where we find ourselves today. Now, Friedman was not the only dissenter. Most economists thought, like, this isn't going to work at all. Um, but the experience of the 1970s really helped shift many more people, economists, and a broader public towards Friedman's perspective. You know, they saw that price controls didn't work. They saw that inflation had something to do with the Federal Reserve. It sort of opened their mind to his ideas and made them receptive to his larger theoretical analysis and his ideas about freedom and individualism. So 
Friedman's vindication was not really on the technicalities of monetary policy. In fact, as the economic system evolved, often the technical details he recommended didn't end up fitting. But this basic idea that money matters became very foundational and that the Fed matters and that monetary policy should aim for stable money growth or stable inflationary growth really comes right out of Friedman and owes uh, much to him and to him and Schwartz. So if over time this idea has waxed and waned, it has really come roaring back since 2021. And in part, that's because we find ourselves in an inflationary episode that while not as bad as the 1970s, for the first time is kind of heading back up into that territory. And, and uh, admirers of Friedman have also pointed in explaining this to sharp movements in M2, which was Friedman's favorite monetary aggregate. He said, this is the most important thing to be watching. And many have pointed out there's a, a really sort of a phase transition in 2020. This is the uh, uh, coronavirus relief, um, which, which hits then. And when all this happened, the first response of Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell was to say, well, this doesn't matter, and to say, quote, a million years ago it mattered. But it doesn't matter anymore. It's not going to make a difference. We don't have to worry about inflation. So, Although there's been some vindication of Friedman's ideas since, it's not really a vindication he would have wanted. He was never happy to see inflation, even when it proved him right. So um, as I conclude, I know that at least some of you are wondering about the title. Why am I calling Milton Friedman the last conservative? And it's a bit of a provocation, I admit. Um, and it gestures in some ways to shifts in the current contemporary conservative movement. A new suspicion of markets, a new embrace of nationalism, a new reluctance to engage in the world. And all of these really mark a turn away from Friedman and the ideas that he embodied. And in some ways, it's perhaps inevitable that new issues would engage us. Yet at the same time, Friedman tackled questions that are both universal and perennial. How do we balance capitalism and markets with other tools, other goods, rather? If some inequality is inevitable, how much is too much? How can we harness prices and incentives to design robust, efficient public policy? How can we apply the lessons of history to new times? What are the basics of a monetary economy that need watching all the time? And so what I hope to do with this book is to make it possible to think through these questions with Milton Friedman. Even if we don't agree with him, we'll be the smarter for having done it. So thank you so much for your time and attention. So the floor is open for questions. So I'm wondering if you could talk about Chile, um, because um, you know it was it was seen as kind of a laboratory for uh, neoliberal Chicago school um, economics, and so I'm wondering if that um, came into your research at all. And you know, I mean, there were real um, you know human rights abuses and this imposition of this economic system over all of Latin America and very real consequences. And so I'm wondering um, what you found in your research and if he ever had any kind of regrets as to the human cost of that. Yeah, thank you. So I do have a chapter on Chile and towards the end of the book I focus on um, his ideas in uh, Britain and then in Chile. And so a lot of my research was trying to fit his trip to Chile and what is the broader history of Chilean economics and, and the rise of import substitution in general that was an approach to developmental economics that really fell out of fashion over time. And also to kind of correct, there's a lot of misunderstandings about what Friedman's role in Chile was. So he was there for six days. He provided advice to um, the regime of Augusto Pinochet and several Students who had trained at Chicago, only one or two who had trained directly with him, became in charge of economic policy in the regime about two to three years in, not immediately after the coup. Um, so 
Friedman was pretty much the world expert on inflation. And when he got to Chile, they had 300% annualized inflation. This was down from 600% annualized inflation during Allende. So he really felt he was actually doing a social good by coming to this country and saying, here's how you get inflation down, because you're not going to have prosperity or stability or economic growth with 300% inflation. So he never felt that he did anything wrong. He did believe that he could give advice to a regime without that meaning, I endorse and support this regime. And so I think it's hard for us to understand a little bit, because today we have this um, idea that the way you communicate your moral values is by disengaging, and that if you are to engage with something, you must morally support it. It's not the framework that he had. And so he did feel um, terrible that it was misinterpreted that this was like an endorsement and a support of Pinochet. And he felt like, I went to communist countries. I'm definitely not a communist. Why am it being assumed that I'm a supporter of this regime? And so um, I think over time, he tried to communicate more clearly. I believe in political freedom, not just in economic freedom. But yeah, it's a, it's a big question. I would commend to your attention Sebastian Edwards' book on the Chile project, because I think a lot of the understanding of Friedman in Chile has been really shaped by, say, Naomi Klein's rather more polemical approach. And we have a whole set of new research coming out that enables us to think more about how did this policy actually work, and what is the connection between military dictatorship and these ideas. So yeah, I would, I would pass the baton on to someone who studied that in more depth in, in many ways. Thank, Thank you. you. Question here? Hi. Uh, thank you for being here. So I know that Friedman passed away just a few years before the financial crisis, which is one of the probably major, if not one of the most major economic events following the Great Depression, and also saw a resurgence of a lot of new government policies and regulations. What do you, or how do you think the three would have made sense of that? So, so it's interesting. One, one potential proxy for Friedman is Anna Schwartz. And um, uh, Anna Schwartz had some very strong opinions about the financial crisis, one of which was that the bailouts were creating a lot of moral hazard. And she said, why are we bailing out the banks? We're not bailing out people with mortgages. This is really going to cause some problems. I don't know that he would have followed her in that because he tended to support emergency relief spending. I do think he would have followed her interpretation was that a driving force behind the great financial crisis, in her view, was of artificially low interest rates, which created a housing bubble. And so again, it's a monetary interpretation. And the, I think the more um, widely known interpretation is that it's a failure of regulation. I think that's probably an element as well. But this, this um, monetary analysis is still there. And towards the end of his life, you, he was like, I don't know about these low interest rates. Like, low interest rates aren't really always a good sign. Like, he was troubled. And it's just in a few interviews he did before he died. Um, but I think that would be, he really saw money and credit policies as just the prime movers in economics. And the other stuff was kind of following in their train. can't have answered all of your questions. There we go. Yes. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm a question that someone asked you last night, uh, but I think you had directed us to, uh, to you. So I'm curious <laughs> more about uh, like individual actors in free markets and kind of like the more theoretical idea of you know, individuals with the freedom of choice will maximize their utility, yeah. um, and then comparing that to more kind of recent research with behavioral economics about like the predictable irrationality of human behavior. And so I'm wondering, did you ever come across like maybe later writings from Friedman about behavioral economics and how he viewed that or what he would think about that, that new field? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I, I have kind of two thoughts on that. One, I do think he had a kind of thin account of human behavior and motivation. On the other hand, he would say, this is, this is an approximation, and it's an analytically useful approximation. And so, um, sure, maybe people don't maximize um, utility in every moment of their day, but if we're looking at lots of people over a large swath of time, a clear pattern is going to emerge of people trying to maximize their utility. I don't know about, I don't think he was around for behavioral economics. I will say he did not um, like real business cycle theory, which is sometimes 
because it's from Chicago, it's like, oh, he must have. And he kind of kept his mouth shut about it. But I've seen some letters where like real business cycle theory was sort of like, we can defeat the business cycle. We can, you know, it's kind of like random perturbations. And he was much more like, no, you're going to have like booms and busts. That's just going to be a part of capitalism. So um, in that way, he was, um, he would be more empirical and more anti-theoretical. But yeah, I think that's one of the more interesting innovations is behavioral economics. I, I don't know exactly how you make um, large scale human behavior tractable without some assumptions of rationality. So that's someone else's problem, not mine. <laughs> yeah, in the back. Did you explore any, in your book any of his uh, philosophical writings about the method of positive economics? Is, is, does that play into other things, in your opinion? Yeah, I mean, that's, this question's kind of building on that. I talk a little bit about that. That essay, there's maybe five or six books about that essay. Um, which for me was like, okay, someone else has already dealt with this. I don't need to go into it too much. But so this is the idea of um, a theory is useful if it predicts. Um, and that, you know, so again, it's, it, a theory is meaningful if it predicts what will happen, even if people don't act like this in the real world. The one thing I discovered that's really interesting that I don't think has really been brought out before is some scholars have looked at this as like a defense or resuscitation of like homo economicus. It's actually an argument against um, the trend towards mathematical analysis in economics. And it's an argument against specifically the Coles Commission, which was an early group of econometricians at Chicago that Friedman absolutely hated. And he thought the idea of creating a large scale model to uh, predict how things would happen that was abstract and sort of mathematically sophisticated was not as helpful as kind of granular data of the kind he did early in his career. So I think you can take a different, if you understand the disciplinary dispute at the time, you can see that essay is kind of entering into that disciplinary dispute. There also, I will say, the large literature on it is because it's, it's, a, it's a piece in philosophy of science. And he's you know, engaged with Karl Popper and a lot of these different ideas. I will say, though, that what was an economist, it's in the 90s, it says something like, um, you know, that it got, it, it sort of circulated in like a bastardized form. Like, well, Friedman proved that it doesn't matter if a theory is realistic or not. You know, and I think that in that sort of bastardized form, it's not very helpful. Yeah. So in the three decades after the Second World War, you've seen in Western Europe, at least, a lot of movement toward very mixed systems, especially in social welfare. So we had yeah. Cuban, for example, adopting the universal system of healthcare. I wanted to ask you, once these social systems had been very solidly implemented in that politically is it possible to uh, revert to an older, more free market system, how did Friedman, if you have a commentary on those, view these more institutionalized social systems, um, especially with his more free market views? Yeah, I mean, I think Britain is a good case system. Um, so he viewed his role as being an advocate um, for change, but also, you know, he said this is, I think this is a quote that Rahm Emanuel also used, like, there's no change until there's a crisis. And once there's a crisis, you look around for ideas. So I'm going to provide the ideas that were there. In the case of Britain, um, you know, there was a, a lot of inflation and labor unrest and a sense that the state ownership of British Airways, British Telecom, you know, British mines just wasn't working, wasn't efficient. And so um, although Thatcher was not a real, she was more influenced by Hayek than by Friedman. She certainly appreciated Friedman. So Thatcher and Thatcher's government really um, privatized in a way that's really not ever been possible in the United States. You know, when we talk about rolling back the state or this, the, the, the federal government is not that big in terms of what it actually does as it was in Britain. I mean, there were lots of state employees, state firms, and these were sold back. Um, these were put on the private market. So that, that was, he was broadly supportive of that. And I think he would have wanted to see that happen. Also in the Soviet Union, the post-Soviet Union, the same thing. Although here's what's interesting is later in his life, I found a lot of these interviews where he's pretty reflective. And he would say, like, I, you know, I, I really sort of got this wrong. And he said one of the things he got wrong was his mantra after the Cold War and the fall of the Berlin Wall. He said, my mantra was privatize, privatize, privatize. Now I realize that wasn't enough. You need institutions, and you need the rule of law, and those are even more important than privatization. So I think over time, you know, he was very quick to say what he thought, and over time, he might reflect and be like, oh, it didn't quite work out how I thought. In the far back. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, speaking of other places where he may have changed his mind in later years, uh, one of the things I remember about uh, his argument in Capitalism and Freedom in the early 60s is that um, he criticizes the Brown v. Board decision and makes an argument that all discrimination is basically just a choice by an individual market actor, which uh, may come with costs or not, but they shouldn't be interfered with in, in that. Um, and so it's generally against anti-discrimination policy and legislation of all kinds. Is that something that he stuck to in later years as well, or did he um, ultimately revise his mind uh, about that? Uh, yeah, it's, it's a great question. I cover that in some detail. As far as I know, he never revised his opinion on it. I didn't see any like, well, I was wrong about that. Um, he just stopped talking about it. He didn't harp on it once the law passed. Um, I didn't find any comment on the Voting Rights Act. So I think it was just the Civil Rights Act that he opposed. And I, I found that really problematic because he did so in his capacity as an advisor to Barry Goldwater. And he could very easily have said, I handle currency and trade. You know? and, and so like, for instance, he went to um, he give a talk to Harvard students. And he, like half the talk is on the Civil Rights Bill. You know, and what Goldwater thinks about it and why this is justified. And, and it, it clearly was something he felt very strongly about. Um, I think, like Goldwater, he, you know, Goldwater was a racial liberal in many ways and an integrationist in many ways, yet stood against this law. I think Friedman was similar in that it was like a case of principles that he couldn't bend at all. And I talk also in the book, I found an episode of him complaining about he felt his son had been discriminated against for being Jewish. And in the course of lodging a complaint against this discrimination, was with a group loosely affiliated with the University of Chicago, he says, I don't question the right of people to discriminate. You know, but I still think it's bad. So you know, he, he really just had this like, incredible like, stick to on his principles. Like He couldn't bend them. He couldn't modify them. And that was like why his megaphone was so loud, and because his ideas were so crystalline and pure, and in, and in ways that often lead to a mismatch. But at the same time, since they're not diluted or compromised at all, like you kind of know what he's saying. Yes. Thank you so much for a great talk. Um, I was wondering what his impacts were on emerging markets all around the world back then, and maybe till today as well. Um, so besides Chile, were there countries that were specifically um, more keen to hear more on like uh, Friedman's thoughts and were there countries where he was more interested in? Yeah, so he spent um, time in India uh, in the 1950s and he was, it was part of a US government program and he was like, you guys have it all wrong. Like socialism is terrible. Like the economy's never going to grow. And he would kind of come and tell a room full of people this and they would just be like, ah, like they hated it and they hated him. Um, but. <laughs> You know, he really believed that the, the developmental idea uh, uh, throughout, you know, I would say probably until the 1970s was protectionism and foster domestic industries and try to create um, rather than uh, a lot of developing nations tend to sell a commodity um, rather than selling a commodity into fickle global markets, try to build your own industrial base and erect um, tariff barriers. And he thought that just wasn't a good strategy for long term prosperity. And so that was why he you know, advised Chile to change. He would advise any nation to make those changes. Um, he also spent a lot of time thinking about like, this relationship between political and economic freedom. And he really believed, until pretty much the end of his life, when he started to doubt it a little bit, that um, if you had a free market, eventually you would have a free political system. And that's what he said to Pinochet when he was in Chile. And it's what he said about China. And he, he saw Tiananmen Square as the first episode, and he thought there would be more Tiananmen squares, and then it would fall apart, just like the Berlin Wall came down. Towards the end of his life, he's like, well, maybe I'm not so sure, <laughs> because he went to Hong Kong and Singapore, and he saw uh, these kind of other city states, particularly in Asia, as having potentially a different model. And so then he said, well, you could have a place where you have economic freedom and you have civic freedom, which means you can like gather and talk, and you're not you know, under the eye of a totalitarian state. But it's not really political freedom because you can't vote to change the political party in power. So he developed a little more nuance over time. But um, his ideas about development are really what became known as the Washington Consensus um, about trying to create more open and integrated markets and the idea that this would allow every country to specialize in what it did best. Yes? Uh, what do you think Friedman would think about a Malay in Argentina? 
Uh, oh, this is the uh, guy with the dogs? Yeah, the presidential hopeful, yes. Uh, he's kind of a monetarist, right? <laughs> Um, I, you know, I, I only know what I've read in the papers. Um, he seems a little brash for Friedman's taste, it maybe a bit of a, a, a populist rabble rouser. But I think the money question, he would say, absolutely, the way you control inflation is by controlling spending. I can't remember if it's pegged to the dollar. Uh, so there's a, there's a whole literature on how, um, actually, what Friedman would say, which no one would ever follow his advice, I'm not sure he would say for Argentina, but he said about small, smaller economies, ought to not have a central bank and just peg to the dollar. And that would enable you to stabilize. Now, no country is going to be like, I give up my central bank to follow the US. Like, it's just not going to happen it's just because of questions of national sovereignty. Um, so if anything, he would support more of like a crawling peg, which is a new peg, but you adjust and you kind of see how it goes. So you build some type of price flexibility into the system. But yes, I mean, that's a fascinating case. I, I know probably um, not much more than you do, but it's interesting. He's an interesting figure for sure. Um, one of the famous um, statements that Milton Friedman made was, of course, I think it was like around 1970, he made his, his comment or, co or article about the business of um, corporations was only to maximize shareholder value and sort of to depending on how you read that statement, ignore other stakeholders. Yeah. Have you talked about that at all, or do you have some comments about that, whether he continued to believe that? Yeah. It has become more controversial, I think. It has become more controversial. I think it's it's of a piece with his larger work that you kind of focus on, you know, one one thing and not too, too many others. Um, that you know the the goal is to maximize profits, not do all these other things. So I guess I have two thoughts. One is just recovering the context. It's in a moment of the first kind of moment of advocacy, um, like campaign GM Ralph Nader's campaign about General Motors. So it's pushing back against that, and it's a different it's a different milieu than the one we're in now in terms of the gap between CEO income and worker income and things like that. The other perspective I have on that, which maybe is not that popular or somewhat counterintuitive, is I, don't, I, I, mean, I live in Silicon Valley, and everybody is busy saving the world through their billion-dollar startup. And I just, I, I don't know, I feel a little skeptical, maybe like Friedman did, about these grand mission statements um, for, in a for-profit enterprise. So I guess I question a little bit, like, how authentic are they really? And there's a way to read that essay that's just asking corporations to be authentic about like what are you actually doing it's not saying don't regulate don't have laws it's just saying focus on that one thing and the rest of us can get together and be like we're going to tax it away you know or we're going to say you can't pollute um, so I think there's um, I think there's a lot of ways to misread that essay which maybe means it means it's not very well written but um, also means that people kind of bring their own agendas to it last thing I would say is I think that uh, this idea, I really dislike the idea that Friedman wrote this essay and then corporations like burst the bonds of social responsibility and like ran roughshod over everyone. I just, it's not a plausible scenario. What I think is more plausible, and it does have Friedman at work, but it's subtle. So he was also part of the law and economics movement. And in the 1980s, a lot of antitrust rules were minimized and pulled back that made it easier for corporations to merge. So you had the mergers and acquisitions boom. How do you prevent yourself from getting merged or a hostile takeover? You jack up your share price so it's too expensive. So that's an enormous incentive for corporations to concentrate on raising their shareholder price to keep their autonomy. And then you also have a number of shifts in executive compensation gets tied to that high share price. And then you have this kind of runaway train of CEOs with multiples of $1,000 you know, and more income for their workers. So, I just I think the essay is interesting. I don't think it like has as much causal force as some of the other ideas that that he you know could be linked to. We have time um, for one more question. One more. Uh, just a reminder that we do have books available for purchase uh, outside, and you're welcome to bring them in and get them signed. Yes, question. Um, so in the 1990s, I believe uh, there are some people making the argument that uh, Richard Freeman kind of basically predicted the existence or the future development of the really decentralized currencies and such as like bitcoins and stuff like that. Um, and there have been recent pushes to kind of like use more of Bitcoin and to like kind of use that um, and take over like the dominance of US dollar. Uh, what do you think Richard Freeman would have said about uh, the current situation of the digital currency world? So I mean, I think, so Hayek was more a believer in like lots of competing currencies. I mean, Freeman would have said, 
sure, go ahead and try, but what's going to happen is basically a network effect. People are going to want to use one dominant currency. And it, it, they're not going to want to move away from the dollar. Um, people like to use a currency that other people use. And he, his reading of monetary history was like, the state is fundamental to the monetary standard, sort of always and everywhere. Um, so I think he would probably say, you know what? Maybe you're going to have one, maybe like Bitcoin will win out on all the cryptocurrencies, but it's still going to be secondary to the dollar. Just the way the dollars become dominant throughout uh, the sort of reserve currency of the world, because people want one consistent thing. So he really saw like a tie to national sovereignty, he saw kind of the, the power of network effects. Um, and uh, yeah, there's one reason why lots of libertarians on the more radical edge think he's like a horrible statist, um, because he doesn't have the, the sort of anarchic dream of you know, utopian competing currencies. But um, yeah, it, the, I think he talks about the rise of the digital currency, which is why people are like, he predicted it. But he's, more, he's not so hopeful about it as the, the, the crypto enthusiast might have you believe. Yeah. So please join me in thanking uh, Jeffrey Burns for what